Hi guys, welcome to the ENT Uplifter course and I am Dr. Shyam Kalyan N. So this course, the ENT Uplifter course brought out by Quick Fix ENT app is a completely inclusive course which helps the MBBS students understand ENT the way they have to for their pre-final ENT exams as well as for their NEET, NEXT and FMGE exams. Our course is special in the way that we provide you notes, flowcharts, simple line diagrams and we explain all the important ENT topics from an exam point of view in the form of videos. Now when we explain things in the form of videos, the advantages are that you understand them better, you retain them in your minds better and you recollect them better in your exams when you have to write. So the additional advantage of providing notes, line diagrams as well as flowcharts are that you are able to bring out better answers during your exams so that you score flying colors in your pre-final MBBS exams. And we provide special high yield points of all these topics which will be of immense help to you during your NEET, NEXT and FMGE exams. So come guys, let's learn ENT in a smart way and more importantly, Let's have fun reading ENT and let's make it enjoyable to you and let's make sure that you have fun during this whole journey of studying ENT. So if you like our videos, if you like our channel, please subscribe to our channel. Please like, comment and share our videos. And for those of you who want to watch more of our videos, there are plenty of them in our Quick Fix ENT app. I repeat the Quick Fix ENT app. So you can download the app in your Android and iOS devices and the details are in the description. Thank you. Welcome guys. This is a video on diagnostic nasal endoscopy in the ENT uplifter course brought out by Quick Fix ENT. Now when you talk of diagnostic nasal endoscopy, there are three important terms in this. You are going to deal with nose. It is an endoscopy. You put a telescope inside and you're going to view everything on a screen. And this is for diagnostic purposes. You're not going to do any therapeutic or any intervention. You're just going to diagnose. So now you can also see the interiors of a nose using a thudicum speculum and lifting up the ala like this. That's called your anterior rhinoscopy. So in relation to your anterior rhinoscopes, Endoscopes have better illumination. There is a good lighted thing that you see. It magnifies the image in the screen. You can see small minute structures in a bigger way that helps you understand better. It has angled views. You have endoscopes which are 0 degree angled, 30 degree, 45, 70, 90. So you can actually turn the endoscopes in an area of interest and it will give you an angled vision which is not possible with your naked eye and endoscopes will help you view smallest clefts and crevices inside the nasal cavity. So you know very well that the lateral wall of the nose which we discussed in our nasal anatomy has a lot of bulges, meati like your turbinates, meati, orifices. So all these things can be viewed or visualized very clearly using endoscopes. So that's the advantages of endoscopes over your anterior rhinoscopy. Now, when do you have to do a nasal endoscopy, a diagnostic nasal endoscopy? To diagnose diseases of nose and paranasal sinuses. If there is epistaxis and you want to diagnose or identify the source of bleeding, you want to assess the response to surgical or medical therapy like for example a patient has a lot of polyps so you did an endoscopy and you found that the nasal cavity was filled with polyps then you give some steroids and then you want to review him after a week or two weeks you see how you want to see how many of the polyps have reduced or you do a sinonasal surgery like a functional endoscopic sinus surgery you remove all the polyps now he has come for a review after a few weeks now you want to see how good the insides are, how good the nasal cavities are. So you want to assess the response to surgical or medical therapy. Now in the last case you have a patient with a sinonasal mass. They are not like polyps, they appear something like a sinonasal mass, something like a of a tumorogenic origin. So instead of directly going for surgery, you take a small biopsy, you send it for your histopathological examination and you await a report. 
So when you want to take such a biopsy, you do it endoscopically. So the indications are, so mind it, even though you are taking a biopsy, it is for a diagnostic purpose. It's not a therapeutic, you know, therapeutic measure. So the indications for D and E are to diagnose diseases of nose and paranasal sinuses, to diagnose the source of bleeding, to assess the response to surgical and medical therapy, and to take precise biopsies. Now, the anesthesia that you would be using for a diagnostic nasal endoscopy is, so you can do it in two ways. Usually a diagnostic nasal endoscopy is done under LA in your office setup. But if you have a really uncooperative patient, if you, if you have a very young child who is not at all cooperative, you may have to use GA also. But generally, in our outpatient setup, when we have good cooperative patients, we do diagnostic nasal endoscopy under LA. And what do you do? You will give a 4% lignocaine or xylocaine, topical 4% lignocaine or xylocaine, they are the same, or lidocaine, and you mix some vasoconstrictor in it. So the vasoconstrictor can be your oxymetazoline or xylometazoline, or it can even be your adrenaline. So the concentrations have to be careful because if you use a lot of adrenaline, the heartbeat might shoot up. So it is better to avoid adrenaline in an outpatient setup and rather prefer oxymetazoline and xylometazoline. And there are various combinations, like you can use 4 ml of 4% lidocaine and 4 ml of oxymetazoline. Some surgeons use a different ratio. The idea is to put it in cotton patties and you pack the nose for 5 to 10 minutes before you embark on your nasal endoscopy. So, under LA, even under GA when you do, you do pack the nose. Instead of LA, you can use saline plus vasoconstrictor so that that area becomes little um, decongested. So, you do nasal packing with this and the position is preferably supine and the patient lies down, his tension and his fears are allayed. They are more cooperative. But in various centers, you do nasal endoscopies when the patient is in sitting position also. This is more useful when you have to show the findings to the patient, like you have a screen in front of the patient and you do the endoscope like this so that the patient himself will be seeing what comes on the screen. Now what all instruments do you use for endoscopy? You have a 4 mm endoscope or a 2.7 mm endoscope. These are the diameters, like the endoscope, the diameter, 4 mm and 2.7 mm. So the 2.7 mm endoscopes are generally regarded as pediatric endoscopes. A 4 mm endoscope or a 2.7 mm endoscope can be 0 degree, 30 degree, 45, 70 and even 90. We do not really use 90 degree endoscopes inside the nose. We usually use them for larynx. We put it through the mouth and see the larynx. So the 90 degree becomes useful. For nasal cavities, 0, 30, 45 and 70 are commonly used. And 0 is the most common. In addition to the endoscopes, you need something to connect to the endoscope. There is a camera port and a light source. So this, the rod is the endoscope. You have a camera source and a light source. A camera port and a light source. The light source and camera port will go into a unit and from the unit there will be a TV screen. So in addition to it you have Freer's elevator, you have elevator with suction or a suction elevator, you have suction tips, you have biopsy tips. An important thing is anti-fogging solution because each time you put inside the nose the patient is breathing. So the endoscope becomes fogged. So you use an anti-fogging solution or sablon. That's the yellow color liquid that you place near the patient when doing an endoscopy. You may also want to use a bipolar cautery if you anticipate any bleeding or if it's a patient of a bleeding, you might want to combine the diagnostic procedure along with the therapeutic thing. So you might want to use a bipolar cautery also. So we discussed what instruments are used in a diagnostic nasal endoscopy the endoscopes, a Freer's elevator or a suction elevator, suction tips, biopsy forceps, savlon solution and bipolar cautery. And of course, if there is very severe bleeding, you might even want to use some ribbon gauze or mirror seals for nasal packing. So the length of an endoscope is very important for your next and neat exams. The length of your endoscope is 18 centimeter. 
Now, after you remove the nasal packing, you have three classic pauses that is explained in all your undergraduate textbooks. So you have your first, second and third pass and we shall see what these passes mean. Okay. So now you have prepared the patient, you have given him adequate anesthesia, you have removed the nasal packing and now you are now you want to inspect the insides of the nose. You want to see the nasal cavity completely on the left and the right side. So now there is a way to see it. You have three different passes so that you don't miss out on any structure inside the nose. This is so that you go in a very systematic approach so that you go in each pass you have a predetermined set of things that you have to see. You can note them down and then you can go to the next pass. So the first pass or the inferior pass, you pass the endoscope along the floor of the nose straight into the nasopharynx. And after examining the nasopharynx, you withdraw the scope slightly anteriorly and inferior and examine the inferior neitus. And you finally take it out. So this is the first pass. You pass along the floor of the nose into the nasopharynx. And after examining the nasopharynx, you withdraw it slightly forwards and you examine the inferior neitus. So in this pass, the structures examined are the nasal vestibule, the nasal cavity. You see the general condition of the nasal cavity. If there is any nasal discharge, how is the color of the mucosa? Is there any change after you did the packing, any change with decongestion? You check the septum, you check the littles area, you check the septal deviation if there is any spur, if there is any impinging of the septum onto the lateral wall, if there is any septal perforation. Then you see the nasopharynx. You see the eustachian tube opening on both sides. Even though you put it through one side of the nose, once you reach the nasopharynx, you will be able to see the eustachian tube opening of both sides. Torus tubaris, adenoid pad, Fossa of Rosenmuller, which is there behind your eustachian tube orifice, the walls of nasopharynx, like the lateral walls, the soft palate, which is the inferior wall, and the roof, and the posterior wall, mucus drainage channels above and below the eustachian tube orifice. So you have your eustachian tube orifice in the lateral wall of nasopharynx. Certain sinuses have mucus drainage channels which pass above the orifice. Certain sinuses have their mucus drainage channels which pass below the orifice. The anterior sinuses drain through below the orifice. The posterior sinuses drain through above the orifice. And you also see the effect of palatal musculature on ET orifice. You ask the patient to swallow and you can see how the palatal musculature will act on the eustachian tube orifice. So now what all do you see in the nasopharynx? You see the eustachian tube opening of both sides, the torus tubaris, the adenoid pad, the fossa of Rosenmuller, the walls of nasopharynx, mucus drainage channels above and below the eustachian tube orifice and the effect of palatal musculature on eustachian tube orifice. The next thing that you see in your inferior pass or the first pass is the upper surface of the soft palate uvula and you see the inferior meatus when you withdraw the scope. The inferior meatus is just lateral to the inferior turbinate it will have your nasolacrimal duct opening. It is usually guarded by the Hasner's valve. If you put a small a light pressure on your lacrimal sac, then tears can be seen coming out through the Hasner's valve. And suppose there has been any inferior antrostomy, you can see an inferior nasal antral window. That this is a connection between the nasal cavity and the maxillary sinus through the inferior meatus. So it's called an inferior antrostomy. If that has already been done in your patient, you will be able to see an inferior nasal antral window. And through that, if you use an angled telescope or an angled endoscope, you can see the interiors of your maxillary sinus. So we saw in your first pass, you pass it along the floor of the nose, go into the nasopharynx, come out, see the inferior meatus. You see the nasal vestibule, the nasal cavity, the septum, the nasopharynx, the upper surface of soft palate and uvula, the inferior meatus. Now you have your second pass. In this, the endoscope is passed between the septum and the middle turbinate. That means 
you pass it medial to the middle turbinate. No, you're not going to examine the middle meatus that comes in the third pass. In the second pass, you pass it medial to the middle turbinate, that is between the septum and the middle turbinate. And you see these things. You see the posterior part of middle turbinate. You see something called sphenoethmoidal recess. This is where the sphenoid sinus opens. So the sphenoethmoidal recess is between the septum and the superior turbinate, just one centimeter above the posterior coina. So you pass it between the septum and the middle turbinate. You see the posterior part of middle turbinate if there is any congestion, if there is any sphenopalatine, sphenoethmoidal artery that is gorged. And then you see the sphenoethmoidal recess which is at one centimeter above the posterior coina between the septum and the superior turbinate. You also see the superior turbinate. You see the superior meatus, the openings of posterior ethmoid sinuses and you see if any supreme turbinate is present. A supreme turbinate is the uppermost turbinate even above the superior turbinate. In some people you might find a supreme turbinate. So the examination of sphenoid sinus ostium and also the posterior ethmoid sinuses inside the superior meatus may require a thinner endoscope, a narrow endoscope like a 2.7 mm endoscope or sometimes even angled endoscopes. Now we move to the third pass. This is the most important pass. The endoscope is passed from the front into the middle meatus. So for that you might have to displace the middle turbinate slightly medially. The anterior part of middle turbinate is displaced slightly medially very carefully not in a rough fashion because if you rock the turbinate you might cause a CSF leakage. So you displace it slightly medially, put your endoscope lateral to the middle turbinate and examine the middle meatus. This can also be done. You can actually insert the endoscope into the middle meatus at the back part of the middle turbinate also. You first pass it medial to the middle turbinate. Then from the posterior part of the middle turbinate, you try to negotiate the tube, the endoscope, negotiate the endoscope into the middle meatus from the posterior part of the middle turbinate because at this area it is wider. So either ways you enter the middle meatus and now what all do you see? You see the most important structure called the osteomeatal complex which is very important for your sinonasal drainage. The osteomatal complex comprises the uncinate process, the hiatus semilunaris, the bulla ethmoidalis, ethmoidal infundibulum, frontal recess. And you also see, in addition to the osteomatal complex, you see the frontal recess, agar nasi cells, any turbinate sinus, any supra or retrobular recess, which are called lateral sinus. You might also see the ground lamella or the middle one third of the middle turbinate. So, what all do you see in the middle meatus? You are going to see the osteomatal complex, which includes uncinate process, hiatus semilunaris, bulla ethmoidalis. Through the hiatus semilunaris, you can appreciate the uh, ethmoidal infundibulum. You will also see agar nasi cells, frontal recess, turbinate sinus, lateral sinus of Grunwald, and ground lamella of middle turbinate. Now, there can be some complications when you do a diagnostic nasal endoscopy. There could be bleeding. In that case, you should keep vasoconstrictor strips. You can place surgi seal, you can place mirror seal, you can place some gel form, or you can even pack the nose. You can use a suction. If there is very severe bleeding, you might have to use a bipolar cautery also. Sometimes there will be pain. Like when I said, you are displacing the middle turbinate so that you can pass the scope, it can cause a pain. Sometimes there might be a severe septal deviation and that might make your negotiation of the scope slightly tardy and difficult. That can also cause pain. So in these cases, if you want, you can keep some cotton wicks placed with lignocaine. More cotton wicks can be placed. You wait for five minutes and then you do the endoscopy. Or you can inject a little bit of local anesthetic. 2% lignocaine can be injected into the mucosa. So it's not like DNA is without any complications. It depends on the surgeon as well as the anatomy inside. Sometimes a rough endoscopy can cause a lot of pain and bleeding. Sometimes the anatomy inside might be in such a way that pain and bleeding may occur. And you know how to control these things. Now there is a slight contrast between CT scan and nasal endoscopy. 
because these are the two main important investigations which we do to a sinusitis patient. A CT scan provides, you know, one data point and time. It's like a snapshot, you know, in that phase when the patient presented to you and you do the CT scan. So the CT scan is like one snapshot of that time. Now, when you talk of nasal endoscopy for chronic rhinosinusitis, the disease chronic rhinosinusitis has a dynamic course with alternating quiescence and exacerbations and it requires serial scans. So you can't keep asking the patient to get serial CT scans because CT scan involves radiation. So every time the patient comes, if you want to know more details about the insights, the best method is to do a nasal endoscopy. Although it is invasive, it will actually show you immense details and it doesn't cause any radiation harm to the patient. Now CT scan provides very little information about mucosal hyperemia or atrophy. Whereas mucosal hyperemia and atrophy can be very clearly seen in nasal endoscopy for proper diagnosis. Now a CT scan doesn't differentiate between secretions, mucosal thickening, polyps or mass lesions. You will see a gray area in CT scan and that can be a polyp, that can be a synonasal mass, that can be a fungal debris, that can be any mucosal thickening or secretions. It doesn't differentiate. Whereas an endoscopy can actually differentiate between a polyp or anything inside the nasal cavity. By the looks of it, you will be able to see, you will be able to palpate, you will be able to see how glistening it is. The CT scan provides little information regarding the type of inflammation, whether it is allergic, fungal, bacterial, etc. Whereas in an endoscopy, you can see the cobblestoning and the allergic mucosa, the blue pale mucosa very clearly. You can find fungal debris, black studded spores or fungal spores very clearly. You can find bacterial rhinosinusitis with thick pus coming out of the sinonasal ostea, the sinus ostea. So these are the differences between CT and nasal endoscopy with regards to sinusitis. The CT is like a snapshot, whereas endoscopy can give you the dynamic course of the disease showing its quiescence and exacerbations. CT scan has radiation, whereas endoscopy doesn't involve radiation. So you can do serial scans, serial endoscopic scans. CT scan provides little information about mucosal hyperemia or atrophy, whereas your endoscopy does. CT scan doesn't differentiate between secretions, mucosal thickening, polyps or mass lesions, whereas endoscopy does. Your CT scan provides little information regarding the type of inflammation, allergic, fungal or bacterial, whereas endoscopy provides a lot of inf information about the etiology, whether it's allergic, fungal or bacterial. Now, there are some disadvantages of uh, an endoscope. So the above contrast between CT and endoscopes can also be regarded as the advantages of endoscopy. Doesn't involve radiation, can do serial scans, gives details about the etiology, differentiates between secretions, mucosal thickenings, polyps and mass lesions, gives you idea about mucosal hyperemia and atrophy. But there are some disadvantages of your endoscopy as well. If you have a very gross DNS with an obstructed nasal airway, you can't pass the endoscope. Endoscopes can cause optical illusions. You need to frequently use an anti-fogging solution. You, can, you cannot appreciate any depth perception. There is no depth perception in endoscopes. And if you, you know, in that sphenoethmoidalis area, the posterior part of the middle turbinate where you have your sphenoethmoidal artery, it doesn't give you any information on the position or the status of the vital structures there. It will just show you a mucosa and if it's hyperemic, you can think that, okay, the blood vessel there is very, you know, engorged or dilated, but you doesn't give, it doesn't give any information about the structures inside it, the position of the artery or the exact extent of the disease inside. And endoscopes are also plagued by light reflection and optical illusions. Now, there is always a complementary nature of CT and DNA. It's not like when a patient comes with sinusitis to you, you do only CT or you do only DNA. You do both. Both give you information which the other can't. So 7% of normal CT scans show abnormal diagnostic nasal endoscopy and 68% of abnormal CT scans 
show additional information of diagnostic nasal endoscopy. So these two statements will actually, uh, you know, very clearly tell you that there is a complementary nature of CT and endoscopy. So we discussed in this video what your diagnostic nasal endoscopy is. What are the advantages of endoscopes over your anterior rhinoscopy? When do you do a diagnostic nasal endoscopy? What sort of anesthesia you use and how the patient is positioned? What instruments you require before you embark on a diagnostic nasal endoscopy? So we discussed very detailed about the three passes. The first pass, the second and the third, the first pass, the what all the structures we see. In the second pass, you see what all structures and the important third pass where you see your osteomedal complex. We saw what the complications of a diagnostic nasal endoscopy can be. We had a comparison between CT and D and the relative advantages of DNA over CT. We saw the disadvantages of the use of an endoscope for this purpose. And we also saw how CT and BNE are complementary to each other. So this is a very important topic for you for your pre-final MBBS final, I mean your pre-final MBBS exams. So it is important that you understand the concepts. You have three passes in your DNA so that you do not miss any information. So each pass will show you something. So you go in a systematic and organized way so that you get maximum information from your DNA and you don't miss any finding. I hope this video is useful to you. We have given you a lot more details than what you require for your pre-final MBBS exam. This is to keep in vogue with, you know, you need to read a lot for your NEAT, NEXT and FMG exams. So we have provided more details in this video so that it's helpful for you for your NEAT, NEXT and FMG as well. Thank you.